Hello, welcome to SuperCloud 6. I'm the panel host for the AI Founders Day. And I'm a serial entrepreneur and an AI executive uh, for a long time. I'm so happy to invite two of the uh, founders in Silicon Valley to discuss a very interesting topic. AI developers, right? Um, is AI going to develop, uh, replacing developers, that sort of things. So uh, first, uh, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit, right? And then tell us not just what you do, but also the journey get to here. Uh, Eddie? Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> My name is Ellie Schleifer. I've been in tech 20 plus years. I started out at Microsoft. I had a B2C startup uh, out in Boston area that I ended up selling to YouTube. Um, I ran that organization inside YouTube for three more years. After that, I went to work on self-driving cars at Uber. Uh, worked there for three years. And it was really at Uber, building self-driving cars. We had about 600 engineers working inside a giant model repo, you know, cranking on code. And the day-to-day -day process of being an engineer in that organization was really hard. Like what we noticed, um, we were basically building the underlying operating system of that car. But as you know, staff engineers the, with my co-founders, we saw it's very hard to actually make any progress inside this project. You know, um, the developer experience, the tooling that was in place was really lacking. And coming from Google, where I'd say like it's really amazingly easy to build software inside Google three, what they've built there is just tremendously like amazing efficiency for your engineers. And we're really lacking that. And I saw this massive opportunity to say, what if we could bring Google quality developer tools to the world? And that's why we left uh, Uber and we started Trunk uh, three years in now. And we really focus on building developer experience tools for large teams. Yeah, for large team, that's the key, right? You know, I really like the com uh, company's name, Trunk, right? Because I remember I grew up at VMware, you know, grew from a very small team to a very large engineering team. And I remember the day that, wow, you know, how come, you know, we grew the company to a certain level, the trunk is always broken, right? The main trunk is always broken. So you need a lot of the tool chains. Um, so yeah, you, you mentioned to me that, you know, when you were at Microsoft, it was a, you know, a little bit different world, but Google, you know, it re they really advanced the, the tool chain. Maybe you can share a little bit, you know, what, what sort of the things that, you know, give us, you know, go a little bit deeper, right? What are the things that are complex, you know, interesting? For sure, yeah. So. Uh, Google 3, inside their, their model repo, they have just amazing automation, right? And really from the point of, I'm writing code, it's going to be tested correctly, it's going to kick off the right set of tests, tests are going to be flaky, We're, they're going to be identified, you're going to have dashboards for all this stuff, the backend systems and CI are just going to always be running correctly, there's automatic code quality tools being put in place, and then of course like a merge queue in place there to make sure that everything merges cleanly, right? All of these things are like basic building blocks that we've seen time and time again, other uh, smaller companies replicating. You know, engineers leave Google, they go and replicate that. You know, we've seen you know, at Shopify and Spotify and just any company you could think of has kind of built different in-house versions of these tools. But these tools really like, should be commercial grade, they need to be enterprise quality. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to basically take those ideas of say, let's make sure we can find all your flaky tests. Let's make sure we could show you where CI is flaky and burning cycles and show that to your engineers. So really empower those code quality, code excellence teams inside uh, you know, large companies to leverage our software and build on top of it. Right? They can then focus on the problems that affect them most and not things that are generalizable to all software engineering. Cool. We'll get to more about what Trunk does in a, in a, a little bit. Um, first, you know, uh, Messi, uh, tell us about you know, the journey you get to starting Metabot. Yeah, happy to do so. So my name is Massimiliano Genta. Just go by Massi, it's a bit simpler. And uh, yeah, we started Metabob about three years ago. Um, the idea started, so my background, I have about 15 year experience also in AI development, uh, a successful company before in the space. However, everything started through the open source. So I'm a very big, I'm very involved in the open source community, part of many communities. And uh, a few years ago, my co-founder and I, Avinash, we were a part of a community we started called Kleist, where initially our goal was to provide a framework to optimize our open source project to run. And uh, following that, we actually also wanted to help contributors to monetize from their work. And in order to do so, we developed a technique to look at PR, look at each commit, and try to identify how likely are those commits or how likely those commits will change over time will need revisions over time. With the goal of trying to identify the ROI of each commit, right? How, 
what's the monetary value of it, specifically for big projects. And through that project, which was completely just mainly for fun or to help the community, we developed this pipeline. Then, then uh, we realized it had great potential because we could predict over time how likely a specific code neighborhood will change based on their semantic markers, based on data flow, structural integrity. So we had many input that we looked at. And, uh, and because of it, we actually, at the same time, I was actually working as EIR, Entrepreneurial Residence for NSC. We were working at a lab at Princeton. And so we were also looking how to optimize the code review process, right? As you know, we all know as developers, debugging itself is one of the biggest challenge. And also what debugging means is up to interpretation, but for us was really identifying like, it's really the designing of the program, right? It's not just the, the writing, the code itself. And so we actually thought that the technique we developed through the open source could have been used perfectly for this specific task. And so that's really how Metabob started. So uh, we're still very close with the open source community as we do offer our tool for free to them. Uh, we have an idea extensions. But uh, yeah, everything started there. So from there. the evolution point of view, early on you were sort of detecting the likelihood for the code to have revision. Yeah. Now Metabob is to detect the likelihood that the, a piece of PR has a bug or? Yeah, well, it's still, we still do the same. So we developed the pipeline. Obviously, it's greatly improved over time. Mm -hmm. As uh, um, again, there are many components to that, the way we classify data um, and the way we train it. So we look at both. Uh, code, but also things outside the code, like uh, obviously the PR. Um, we look at like uh, um, code changes. And yeah, our main technique, it helps us to predict where problem will occur in specific area of code, right? Mm. And then what we use, we, we use that context to feed into generative AI, so to LLMs that we developed, to then create explanation and recommendations on how to resolve the issues we detect. So. Over time it has evolved, but uh, the main concept is still the same. Like we still follow this technique, which is based on several AI methodology. We um, use something called graph neural network uh, to map the data. We use, uh, um, again, vector database, but we have many, really what makes us unique is the pipeline we developed. Right, so let me just uh, go a little, one step, you know, deep into the product you guys are offering. You know, Ellie, you mentioned that you are bringing the Google quality tool chain, right? But it could mean so many different things. <laughs> so can you just, uh, like, uh, for instance, you know, one or two very specific problems you're solving for developers? Yeah, so we have an uh, automated code quality tool <clears throat> that is uh, basically going to run all the right static analysis tools, formatters, linters, on any so figuring out the bugs potentially. This is more like to maintain like code quality and conformity and uh, stylistic, you know, okay. idiomatically correct okay. code, right? Your organization says all TypeScript functions have to run a certain way. We're going to run ESLint for you. Make sure that those rules are applied correctly. But we're going to run that ESLint for okay. your TypeScript and GoLang CLint. So less about code. buffer overflow detection sort of things. Right. This is okay. like these things are all built also into static analysis yep. tools, right? So okay. it really depends on the language. Um, yep. Native uh, languages have a lot more tooling around those kind of problems. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, for as you get into larger teams, we have a merge queue solution that's basically going to make sure that you don't end up with a broken main build, a broken trunk branch. Um, and then we're bringing to market now a flaky test solution. So you're, uh, as engineers write code or uh, generative AI writes code and writes tests, those tests are inherently going to start going flaky. It's just uh, basically a nature of uh, entropy. As, as you might say. Um, and those flaky tests tend to really crush developer productivity. Mm. So we're trying to look at that as a holistic problem. How do we give engineers back their time? Because right now the solution is hit the retry button or automate retries. And both of those are pretty lousy solutions to keeping engineers moving quickly. We're trying to basically make engineering like efficient and fun. As you wanted to the, pick the, pick the you know, uh, detect the flaky test and then yank, yank it out, out of the system. Yeah, so even better than yanking it out. If you yank out the test, I'm losing signal, right? So engineers are very loath to be like, just comment out the test. Well, that test was written for a reason. We're actually going to run the test, and we're going to quarantine the results. So if it fails, we're going to say, hey, this failed, but you still got to run it. Because as soon as you turn it off, you're creating greater trouble for yourself. Got it, got it. So along this line, what is the AI angle in your company or in your company's product? Yeah, so the AI angle here on this, in this flaky test is really to look at uh, what are the problems that are coming out of these, these test reports? Can I generalize them? Can I summarize them to something that's easier to consume 
as a engineer, right? So, so may, I, may, get, get a more explain, explainability out of it. Exactly, because you know these tools are going to generate long logs and long stack traces, and trying to just condense those into something that's mm, uniform, mm. and then looking at it holistically, is this problem similar to these other problems, right? And then say, actually, this is a problem across you know thirty tests in the last thirty minutes. This is not a problem of this test going flaky, but actually CI is on fire, as we like to say, and we need to address this you know more at a higher level. Right, call in the SREs or call in the DevOps people to fix this problem. Maybe you know some external source used to you know s uh, reply at a certain rate, and now they have rate limiting, and now all of your tests are going to be broken. Do you see a lot more percentage or a lot more volume of the tests being written by Gen AI these days, or in, in the foreseeable future? I would see that like as code grows, we'll have more tests. Everything, especially complicated tests, integration tests, uh, to make sure that all these systems work together, which is really what like large real companies are doing. They're building really highly integrated systems, when you're doing that, your, your tests, because they're talking to other systems, are going to be flaky, and you're going to be sus, sus, you know, your CI pipeline is going to be subject to that kind of um, invariability. Uh, but so you are saying that you are anticipating that, but you, it's not quite a major, m the mainstream just yet. Oh, no, it's a huge problem already. It's Co a huge Code that engineers, right? Yes. No, I'm As, talking yeah. about Gen AI generated. I would say anything that anything that is generated that is code is going to be uh, subject to flakiness, because sure. uh, flakiness can be determined even just by uh, the interaction of tests. Right, that an AI bot would be very uh, unlikely to understand. That if I run this suite in a certain order, there's a presumption that this file will exist or not exist, and therefore mm. this test will be flaky depending on what random order that test runner picks that day. Right, so a lot of these things are not going to be protected by a generative system right up front. They're going to keep writing bad tests. Right, right. So, Massey, you, you, know, you were doing AI before Gen AI or before AI was, is red hot, right? So, any perspective to share and then also how you are thinking about you know, using AI or in particular Gen AI in your product? Yeah, well, when it comes to Gen AI per se, we'll use Gen AI as everybody does, which is creating content, right? Um, and so, our core like Metabob itself, obviously we use AI in the entire pipeline for many reasons, many different things. Uh, I would say per se Gen AI is just used to create an explanation of what the issues are after we identify in the region of the problem, as well as provide recommendations to resolve the problems we identify. Sounds like a very similar usage, you know, between you and Addy, right? Yeah, um, there's definitely some similarities in some way, but uh, um, so we, again, we, um, use AI, not Gen AI, but uh, in many parts of the product, again, in the classification technique, to be able to um, identify where, again, code changes, um, where specific area of the code and the likelihood of those will change over time um, and to map different parts of the code. So our core, I would say, IP is really into identifying the code region where problems will occur. And then again, what we do is we feed the context is to the Gen AI side of it. So um, again, the Gen AI for us is really used to create content when it comes to uh, now our end is code improvements, uh, refactoring improvements, or to just explain where the bugs, and uh, what are those issues we identify. Um, in terms of my take, uh, well, do you want me to talk more about like uh, uh, what's the specific angle you want me to focus on? Well, you know. One, you already discussed, right, using Gen AI for explainability, right? Yeah. Do you see Gen AI playing, you know, roles, you know, in that area or for your company or for the developers in general? Like, what's your, what's your view? Well, Gen AI, it's great when it comes to, again, creating content, right? When it's uh, learning from input and following input and generating output mm. to that. So anything that comes into that, obviously, our space is one of the, one of the best use cases for Gen AI right now. Uh, again, everything that is content related is, but uh, when it comes to coding, you see tools like Copilot obviously are greatly used, and we leverage LLMs as well right. for our products. So I do definitely see great value in that and keep improving. So we plan LLMs alone, uh, I don't believe necessarily it's something that will be able to do everything just the way the directions that are currently going, which is building larger and larger models. And so, and just the way LLMs function, they're definitely heavily sensitive to how data is presented to them and the input is presented to them. And that's why I believe adding 
different techniques to LLMs is going to be the way to go. Uh, as, and that's what we are trying to do. And I'm sure most entrepreneurs in the developer tool space, but in the AI space itself, they are figuring that out and trying to adding um, more methodology to it to um, solve problems that LLMs have. So let me pose a question to, to the two of you, right? Is AI or Gen AI going to replace developers? <laughs> you want to go first or should I? I mean, as a developer for many years, I, I, I think hi highly unlikely it's going to replace developers. Highly but unlikely. When, when I think about like historically, right, we're talking, let's go all the way back to the 60s, Apollo era. We have computers that are literally just humans that are doing calculations, right? All of a sudden computers get, you know, computer programming languages become more powerful. Now people are writing in assembly, eventually they're writing in C, super low level languages, the amount of things you can do. Did we have like uh, 50 million engineers at the time, but then as we got greater and greater languages, all of a sudden was reduced? No, we had more and more software engineers, right? 20 years ago, there were a million software engineers in this country. Now there are four and a half million engineers, right? Still a small fat, 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 you know, uh, percentage of the workforce. I think overall, we might like have the things that software engineers do, we have, always have to remember is not write code, Software engineers build product, right? They build things that other people care about. And the part of writing the algorithm is not the hardest part of what engineers do. It's not like the, uh, the hardest part of, uh, of being a software engineer is figuring out how to do a for loop or even graph traversal. These are like well understood problems. What really matters, and, and Copilot is great at stuff like that. Be like, write me a function that does XYZ, no problem. Build me a system that interacts and tracks data correctly and stores that in a database in a reliable way and doesn't store too much. The, the server is going to fall over and <laughs> scale that thing, you know, and make sure that you're following GDPR compliance. Like these are things that engineers that's a, think that's about. That's a product. That's a solution. <laughs> yeah, right. these, are, these are what engineers actually do in their jobs, right? They're working and thinking about what is the problem that I'm trying to do, deal with, build the metaphorical model, and then put that into code. Telling the LLM to do that, I think that will be the job more of the engineer be like, let me actually make sure that you're going to do the thing right. I'm going to, I'm going to be like more uh, conducting at the higher level, which makes sense. Like we keep moving higher and higher up the stack of like, what is the responsibility of the engineer? It's going to be more to build, build product and ship product versus I, I'm thinking about the lines of code. So I think you, you're basically saying that a coding is just a smaller portion of the overall developer's job, right? Of course, depending on your seniority, you know, how junior you are, it may, it may be different, but you know, it's still a small portion, right? For that small portion, some of that could be replaced by Copilot or whatnot, but then the rest, you know, it's not going to be touched much, right? That's kind of what you're saying. Yeah, so from absolutely. that point of view, do you see a reduction in the developers, sort of the jobs, right? You know, you mentioned the 4.5 million. Are we going to go back to 1 million or are we going to keep, you know, increasing in your view? I think the software engineers that are working, you know, and the hardest problems will grow. I think the software engineers that might be right now fixing up, you know, Shopify websites, that will, be, that will become less of those, right? And I think that, you know, you see that even with no code tooling, like basically enabling more things to be solved just by someone who doesn't have coding experience. But at the end of the day, like uh, information technology, robotics, all of these things require people to think hard as engineers. I think we'll have more software engineers. Just, you know, I'm hoping for higher quality, higher functioning, you know, software engineering problems. Very nice. Next yeah, well, I have a very similar take, so I don't want to just repeat what, uh, what he said, but uh, I do believe, like, at the end of the day, I don't think it's going to replace. You still need input to give into the AI first, so uh, what the software developer does really, it's like, it, it, like AI can be a new language, we can say, right? So they will still, the, the function and the task will change over time, for sure. Um, it will speed up and automate some processes, but it won't, it won't replace because again, you do need, as AI is growing right now, you need the inputs. And so you always need somebody to provide the inputs and to also improve the model until perhaps we reach AGI, but that's, uh, uh, that might happen a long, long time from now. We can, we can talk about AGI here, right? But you know, the, 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 when, when do you think AGI <laughs> will happen? Well. Not anytime soon, in my opinion. Why we are, that? Well, because uh, our, in order to achieve AGI, like right now, you know, AGI is more about, it's not to just like about, in order to achieve that, the model cannot just be trained on external data like it is right now. Our LLMs are growing. It's more like you just make larger and larger model, but that itself, it's not going to make an AGI, right? 
it, we need many more methodologies to be implemented to that in order to reach that level. And really, the AI needs to understand the relationship between input and output, which right now they cannot do. And just the way LLM are structured, it's not something they will do, right, anytime soon. So, is it, and if you think like how the brain works, right, it leaves markers, it leaves uh, transmitters all around to get um, informations and to learn from it, right, to learn from the input and why specific output occurs, which again, it, right now LLMs don't and cannot do. So I'm not saying it's impossible to achieve, but uh, and I'm sure it will at some point. Um, is it something right now I'm afraid of? No, I am not. <laughs> okay, Eddie. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think there's anything magical about human consciousness and intelligence. I think at the end of the day, we're extremely advanced like machines. So therefore, like to say that we would never be able to you know, create a machine that could have intelligence would be would be I think silly uh, or presumptive like with enough computing power you should be able to achieve it yeah. so when do you think we will get to AGI in your view uh, I couldn't make a prediction towards that I don't yeah, well, I don't work enough in that space to like you know give a concern do you opinion. think that's uh, in the near future or this is uh, you know a little bit further out but it will be there or you know I don't know it's too far like what's your I would, I would say like on like human scale very near future because like you know humans been around for you know tens of thousands of years and if you look at where we were, you know, 50 years ago with our understanding of genetics and computing power right, and right. all the things, you know, that have come in. So the, the trajectory you are seeing that it's kind of a we are getting there soon. Yeah, so. whether, whether it's 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, like it is, it is within like a, a reasonable time frame to achieve such a thing. And then, you know, the sky's the limit, really. So from that point of view, um, you know, what's the future of AI, you know? Like uh, other than developer tools or this, and then you know what? What else are you are you anticipating? Are you you know? Do, do you see that? Hey, I wanted to see something, right? You know what is that? I mean, what I really want to see, I look forward to like you know the reimagining of our cities, right? I mm. like right now. I, I live in San Francisco. There's still cars parked everywhere on the street, but I took a Waymo home from dinner last night, and then that car disappeared right and <laughs> along the way. And I think you know. Robotics uh, and all, which really is driven by artificial intelligence, will really like replace and reimagine the way that our cities look and feel, right? I think even you know quadcopters that can move you from San Francisco down to Palo Alto means I could jump over the freeway, but also means like I could jump up north and go into you know uh, to nicer you know outdoor space really quickly without sitting on on long roads, right? So I think that the way our world looks today is going to be totally different in 20, 30 years, and I can't wait. It's like very excited to think about what the cities will feel like, what it'll feel like to move around. And AI, I think, will be a tool along the way, right? I think so much of what we're do talking about here is how are we going to use these tools to change and make life you know, better, you know, create more, more abundance for everybody. How soon do you think that that world will be? Like the city will be totally different? Oh, I think that, you know, uh, having worked in self-driving cars and now you know, like living obviously in, the, in, a, uh, in a test bed, uh, a petri dish for self-driving, I think in 10 years, like, you know, these self-driving cars will be everywhere, everywhere. And it's going to explode onto the scene. It's going to be feel like a trickle and be like, this will never happen. And then all of a sudden be like, obviously, this is what it is. It'll be like when the cell phone came out, be like, few people had, and then now it's in everyone's hands. Cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that too, honestly. I mean, I'm Both Italian. Both of you live in the city now. Well, yeah, I am Italian, so a lot of my Italian fellow will uh, critique me to say that because, you know, cars, sports cars are big things there. <laughs> However... I'm very much looking forward for just being able to work and travel nonstop without any human driver. That's definitely is one of the most exciting, like near-term uh, evolution that I'm looking forward to. Aside from it, obviously, like when it comes to also Gen AI fields like medicine, legal, it's something right now we don't see as much simply because there is it's a more risky, I would say, like uh, field. Uh, when it comes to like obviously the output are key if AI makes a mistake it's a huge leverage right and um, but we also see I mean that's something that most definitely it's going to happen in the next couple of years as well right because it's just um, there is a bureaucracy side of it and there is also just a tuning part of it that I've seen firsthand how great progress we're making so um, again in the short term that's really what I'm uh, very excited about it because right now most people that are using generative AI, it's either in the marketing field, obviously, 
um, like generating blogs or any type of content in that side, it's very great and it's very easy. Or coding as well, uh, as we discussed, developer tool is a great application for it. But uh, anything really that incl like, uh, includes content can be done by generative AI. Very great. So um, again, the spaces that I'm very excited about is definitely the medical field, the legal field. So that's definitely something I see short, like in the very short and near future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point <clears throat> on the marketing side. <clears throat> I think generative AI generates so much stuff that I never ever want to consume or read because yeah. it's so clearly generated by a robot that has no taste. And I think it's so important, you know, uh, my wife is a writer and uh, when I think about, you know, the, the impact of art and culture, it's like generative AI generates just whatever someone else already did, regurgitated in another form. And what I care about is like uh, is story and what, what actually like, you know, something that's going to resonate. And I think about, you know, um, when digital effects were, like, were all the rage in, uh, in Hollywood and be like, oh, this movie is great because you can see an alien flying through space. But like, now we're like, I don't care about that. What's the story? <laughs> Does it matter is something resonant yeah. that I actually care about and has heart? And I think, you know, it doesn't really matter how great your graphics are in a video game. If there's no good gameplay, you're not going to do it, right? So I think it's like, this is an interesting point where I think gender AI will be awesome in medical because... At the end of the day, yeah, there's no, there's no heart there. I just want the, the medicine to work right. More black and white. Exactly. Yeah. I fully agree with that. And that's to my previous point as well. It's like when everything that requires like art or creativity, right? Like really the, the greatness of AI will only come well. It will be able to learn not just from external data, but also from its own input and outputs, right? And the relationship between the two. So until that happens, then yeah, we will always face the same problem, which is like just an AI based on external data that has been fed in it. Right. I mean, some of the gap, right? You know, not not enough hard, or it sort of looks like from a bot. That has to do with you know the model is still not good enough, right? You know, but let's just uh, you know imagine a world that, that you know GPT five, maybe even six, is released. Right, the marginal cost for AI, Gen AI, is you know approaching zero, you know, in the next few years. Right, uh, we know that's that sort of thing will happen. Right, so what would the world look like? You know, let's come back to the developer sort of the world for a second. Right, you know, we talk about you know outside the developer, just uh, going back to the developer. Like, what, what 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 does the world look like at that point? Like uh, as a developer, well, what to expect? Do I do mostly similar things? But with, you know, of course, writing code is going to be automated or even the way I interact with my product management is going to be very different. How, how do you think about it? I think I'll probably, your IC engineer is going to be doing less like, you know, time typing out algorithms uh, into VS Code. And I think that we'll all be inundated with a whole lot more generated content that then hopefully are generated like chat GPT six bots will reject as spam uh, even better. Like, so at a certain point, it'll be like, you know, I think all the stuff that is generated uh, will become noise to us. And what we'll, we'll actually try to revert to is like, is this actually an email that was sent by you to me and we're actually in real conversation? And if not, I'll be like, I don't, I don't want this, right? It's basically like just more noise into my inbox feed because if generation of you know, email is basically because the price of zero, which it is, then email becomes you know, kind of uh, useless. useless. And I think that's like, you know, we're going to see more and more of that. We'll have to. There'll be an information war for your eyeballs to make sure. Like, how do you protect your eyeballs and your inbox from things that are just being generated at basically zero cost? So I fear for that future. Yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, I will say like uh, it's always hard to tell like uh, how the future will look like in this case because well, obviously if AI becomes more efficient than humans. Well, why do we need humans? No, I'm joking, <laughs> obviously. But, uh, well, I th again, I, I think uh, when it comes to software developers, we said, uh, I don't see uh, any near future where they won't be needed because, again, something that humans always want to do is to improve something. So there's always going to be maintenance. And uh, as we've seen, like uh, managing and running a model, it's definitely time consuming. It's already becoming a commodity when it comes to the cost of it, right? Like we've seen, you can run an AI company with pretty limited costs, obviously, depends what's the scope of it, but uh, it, can, it can already be done, right? We already start seeing that and it's gonna go down, I'm sure. Um, I don't see that 
to get to zero really anytime soon as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, my thought is the same. It's like uh, you still need uh, people to provide the input to the AI, to maintain the AI in a proper way. And when it comes to anything that the AI won't be able to do, um, again, when it comes to LLMs itself, which I guess is the main conversation that people are talking, um, the way, the direction we are going, I, don't, I just don't see really, first of all, the cost to go to zero completely or to be able to perform certain tasks because the direction anyone is going is to build larger and larger models it's, and more complex models, right? So that's, it doesn't, and our LLMs works in general, like they're based on listening to an input and generating an output based on that. So a lot of the concern in that space I just don't see right now until we are going to implement additional methodology to LLMs, which is gonna happen, when it's gonna happen, I can tell you that. But. I think the, both of you are a little bit cautious, right? On the one hand, you do anticipate or hopefully see a world, right? You know, the city or whatnot, right? Leveraging AI, Gen AI, whatever that those technologies. But at the same time, you know, from, from you know, sitting where you are seeing the developer world, right? You don't see, you know, suddenly, you know, I need a ten, 20 developers, now I only need a one or two. You don't see that, you know, that, that's the... That, that's the trend. Sam Altman said, well, we will see one person unicorn at some point, right? But, you know, you are saying that, look, you know, if it's a developer-heavy sort of a solu solution company, a lot of that is, you know, will stay on the same course for a while. But, I mean, does it, think about, like, you know, the smallest unicorn I can think of is probably, like, uh, Instagram. At that point, maybe 20 people, right? So is there a big difference between a 20-person unicorn and a one-person unicorn for something to be worth a billion dollars on 20 people's effort for a couple of years of work like I don't think like that's not a giant base change in you know what we need uh, to build something right uh, I think also obviously I think think about Instagram there was built on top of Facebook which was a giant company already powered by thousands of engineers so even that one engineer is like if you have a one person unicorn they were built on top of the so that you know, one person unicorn is just one person sitting on you know standing on uh, the giant's shoulder, right? It doesn't yeah. mean, by itself, it doesn't mean a lot, right? Exactly, yeah. and I'm the same, on the same idea on that. Cool. Any last word that you want to leave to our audience? Well, on my end, like, well, I always uh, hope everyone will, this is a great time to pursue entrepreneurship as we're speaking today. AI is definitely becoming a commodity, it's accessible to everyone. You need less and less technical skills to start, and there are great applications that can be used for. So, I always if encourage. If you want developers to save time from debugging for the refactory, come to Metabob, right? They can come to Metabob. They can build their own. You know, like uh, uh, developers are famous to also resolve problem by building their own solution rather than using existing solution. Now, I'm not saying not to use Metabob. You should use Metabob, but uh, I always encourage. This is a great time to be able to get into the space as well. Um, I think we have discussed about the consequences of AI, the future of AI. Uh, I'm, aside from just the AI, the technical side of it and the software developers, it might impact the way you know, the entire economy is going to be run. Um, and so when, we don't want to get to that point right now, but uh, it's definitely a great time to get into that. Thank you, Messi. Adi? Yeah, I, I think you know, engineers love to build things. You know. I like for my entire career I got into software engineering to build something it wasn't to write code it was to like build a product and build a solution for something and I think that uh, that is just innate in our human spirit and it's so excited to see all of these technologies flourish because it's just more opportunity to build you know more interesting compelling things you don't have AI you don't have machine learning you don't have self-driving cars like these things are required to solve really interesting problems and that's like where it gets interesting like what are the problems that we're actually going to solve with these technologies, because at the end of the day, I see these as a generative AI or AI in general. It's a tool. How we're going to use it, that's really exciting to me. And to add on that, like, sorry about that, um, I started talking about the open source community, how much involved I am, and I want to just also end it with that. Mm. For everyone who wants to start, you know, AI is a great application, like, uh, open source community are on the rise. As you say, there are many hackathons mm. that are organized on a weekly basis, and I always say, again, encourage 
people in school or people who wants to become an entrepreneur, the best way of becoming an entrepreneur is by doing hackathons, by learning how to solve problems, right? And be part of communities uh, that work towards one goal. I also strongly believe that's the direction AI should go, being open source. And so that's definitely something I really wish to see more and more. Thank you, Messi. Thank you, Eddie. Um, a wonderful conversation about you know AI and also the developer tools, tool chain to help developers to be more efficient. Uh, it's not just uh, you know uh, hey figuring the bug, detecting the bug, but also uh, how you know your suggestion about how to get people more involved, engaged right, through the hackathon. Uh, I really like your sort of the line of. Uh, at the end of the day, AI is just a tool, right? You know, but we, you know, or entrepreneurs or companies, we care about solutions, you know, tool, it's, you know, AI is just a means to an end, right? You know, at the end of the day, AI is not going to replace everything, anything we do. Mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be a wonderful tool, right? Yeah. You know, so thank you very much. Um, and uh, uh, thank you for watching SuperCloud 6, AI founder, and uh, um, have a wonderful day. Thank you, Howie. Thanks, Howie.